All right, stand up on your feet with me, please. You ready to receive God's word? Amen. I'm ready to share it with you today. Psalm 92 and verse 13 says this, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Wow. Then if you're not planted in God's house, it's difficult to really, really, really grow. To grow spiritually, to grow relationally, to grow in your relationship with God. And I just love this promise. I mean, most preachers love this promise. That, because if they're pastoring a church, they want people to be planted in the house. Amen? And our scripture for the entire year and our launching pad for being plugged in is Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. Let's read it together and loudly. You ready? One, two, three. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Let's do it again. You ready? One, two, three. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Get plugged into heaven. Amen? You say, well, that's kind of weird. I've never been to heaven. I haven't either. I know we've, I've read books of people that had visions of heaven and what heaven's like. But I'm going to tell you what, we can have heaven on earth right in our heart. Amen? The prayer, we had a little bit of heaven right here today in our worship service. We had, we had a little bit of heaven when you shook hands with people. We're going to have a little bit more of heaven as the word of God comes forth. Because heaven is, we're taught to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on heaven as it is in earth. So we're bringing on, on earth as it is in heaven. We're trying to bring heaven to earth. Amen. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 from the message translation. I'll read it to you. I really do like this. Eugene Peterson adds some wording. Don't shuffle along with your eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up. Be alert to what's going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Father, we come boldly to your throne of grace today. Lord, we need your perspective on life. We need your perspective on world events. We need to have a kingdom perspective, a world Christian view that comes right straight from the Bible. And the only way that we can get that is be plugged in. Be plugged into what you're doing in marriage. Be plugged into what you're doing in family. Be plugged into what you're doing in, in church, what we're doing in our business. Lord, we want to get plugged in. We want to take Jesus with us everywhere we go. And Father, I'm believing that there are individuals that are watching online, the individuals that will watch later, I'm believing that people in this room right now, that Lord, you will move upon their hearts. Lord, that you will help me communicate today with clarity and with authority that will bring people into a closer walk with you to where they can be plugged in to what you're doing in the earth today. And if you believe that with me, say amen. amen. You can be seated. Last week, just a very, very fast and quick review, I talked about being plugged into what the Holy Spirit is doing in your relationship with God, in your marriage, with your children, your grandchildren, about being plugged into God in your business, in your finances, being plugged into God with your health, your physical, mental, and emotional well-being, being plugged into God with who you're supposed to be friends with. How many of you know if there are some friends in your life that are going to pull you down and not pull you up? You need to be the person that's influencing those relationships, not them influencing you. And that's, you know, you can still be friends with a non-Christian. You can still be friends with someone who's a nominal Christian as long as the influence is on your end, not on theirs. Amen? You need to be plugged into God, into your dreams and your visions and your goals. If you want to, go to uh, Generations Lubbock on YouTube and you can listen to the whole message. It's there. Like and subscribe. Uh, then you'll get to, you won't miss anything. You can always go back and pick it up. Get plugged into what God is doing in our time of prayer and fasting. Pick up one of those prayer guides. 
pick, choose a fast and, and plug in. You know, and remember what we taught last week about fasting. You don't walk around at your job. You don't walk around here at church. You don't let everybody, you're not grumpy at home because you're not getting steak. You're getting something else because you're fasting. That you go ahead and you plug into what God is doing and, and you, you, I promise you, the Bible, the scripture we looked at last week, when you fast and pray secretly, God rewards openly. Amen? Amen? And, and so still put on your perfume, still put on your deodorant, still look nice, still comb your hair, still brush your teeth, do all the stuff. But behind the scenes in secret, you're touching heaven. Amen? And you know what? God's going to do things in an open fashion that will make the world step up and take notice. I ended last week's message right here, and I'm going to pick it back up. Here's what I want to talk about. Start with this morning being plugged into God. When God is first, when God is first, things change. It's when God is third or fourth or fifth. Or when he's somewhere, and you know, I know it's the new year, and this is why I'm bringing it up like this. People do lists. They do resolutions. Resolutions don't work. you got to change your lifestyle. I'm going to say that again. You can write down your whole list of resolutions, what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, blah, 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 blah. Those are things that are on a list, but until you change your lifestyle, nothing changes. And you can't change your lifestyle until you change the way you think. And when you change the way you think, your life changes. And so when you begin to put, when you and I together, when you put, every one of us in this room can remember a time in our life where we knew that we knew that we knew that we knew God was first and everything around us changed. And then we can also remember times in our lives where God was somewhere else down the list and things weren't so hot. And then you went back to putting God first and things changed again. I'm just telling you right now, I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know if you're a Christ follower. I don't know if you're fired up about God. I don't know if you're on the edge. I don't know if you read your Bible every day. I don't know if you pray every day. That's none of my business. That's between you and the Lord. But I'm telling you this, when he is first, things change. Things change in here, and when things change in here, things change out here. Things change in your relationship. Things change in your business. Things change this way. Think, believe it or not, things change in your finances when God is first. Biblically, this is true. It says in Matthew 6, 31, don't worry about these things. And what he's talking about, you can go back and read it on your own. He's talking about food and clothes and the things that you need in life. Don't worry about those things. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. So if you're a believer, that stuff should not be dominating your thinking. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. There it is, when God is first. And live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And then he says it again in verse 34. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow brings its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Put your trust in God for today. Put him first. There is no way, and I used to think like this. I confess. Confession is good for the soul, bad for the reputation. I confess that I used to do this all the time. I would make lists. Well, God's number one. My wife is number two. My children is number three. My ministry is number four. And that was a lie sometimes. I put my ministry in front of everything. Even God. I'm telling you, this is going to shock some of you. Going to shock some of you online. Going to shock some of you sitting right here. God does not want to be number one on your list. That is not his plan for your life. God wants to be the center of your life. And he wants everything else to flow out of the center. It's like this next slide I want to show you. It's like the hub of a wheel. He's the center of everything. 
He's the center. Your family flows out of him. You're, even your fun. I've learned to believe it or not, I've learned to witness on the golf course. When I tell people I'm a preacher, it ruins their golf game. They quit cussing. I tell them it's okay. Preachers don't cuss. They just spit on the ground and the grass dies. I'm joking. But listen, God wants to be, you know, at Watermark on Monday mornings at 1145, we studied this book called God at Work. We went through it. It It's almost a year. But the author of that book, Ken Costa, great book. One of the themes of the book was there's no such thing as secular and sacred. Everything in your life is sacred. And that's what God Wants to be. That's what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. That everything, family, fun, friends, marriage, business, finances, dreams, faith, everything is sacred. Because everything flows out of your relationship with Jesus. So right here, the first Sunday of the new year, when God is first, everything changes. It's so easy to make a decision and raise your hand or make a decision to say, I want to be a Christ follower. And it's easy that you pray. I lead you in a prayer. We, we help people. People get saved at church nearly every Sunday. That's what, my, that's what I'm believing for. And, it, and God's been answer, answered our prayer most of the time in 2023. And I'm believing for that to continue. But here's what we do. We pray Romans 10, 9, and 10. We lead people in that prayer. It's easy to cross the line and say, I will follow Jesus. It gets a little more difficult to make him first. Make him the center of everything. Because when, it, when other stuff crowds in, when work crowds in, when problems, when health crowds in, when different things crowd into your life and they push Jesus out of the center, things start to fall apart. If you take the center, if you take the hub of the wheel out, what happens to the wheel? It collapses. It doesn't function. So my challenge to you today is to make him first. And as Psalm 92.13 said, One of the ways that we make him first is that we get planted in the house of the Lord. The title of today's message is Plugged Into the House. And I want to define church for you. And there's not going to be a big screen deal on it. I didn't do a slide on it. I just want you to think, how do you, what is church? How do you define church? Well, the Greek word for church is ekklesia. I know you're like me. You don't read, write, or speak Greek. You read big, thick books. And, well, I don't read big thick books anymore. I have it on my computer. But let's say ecclesia together. One, two, three. Ecclesia is called out ones. It's a group of people that are called out to assemble together as Christ followers with common beliefs, common thoughts. They can meet in a church like this. They can meet in a village, in a home, in a coffee shop. They can even meet in a break room. You can have church. Jesus said, where two or more gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. Do you know why I know Jesus is in this building today? Because you're here. Because you showed up, he showed up. And it happens every Sunday. What, you don't, what some of you may not know is the worship team gets here between sometime, I, I don't know exact time, 7 and 7.30. And they're up here rehearsing and practicing their songs. I don't, I don't, I don't know whether you really understand this or not. But Jesus shows up when they show up, not when you show up. I mean, the presence of God is in this building. Because you're here. Not because we sang some special songs, or not because it's Sunday, or not because we're in a building that's called a church. He's here because you're here. Called out once. Gather in his name. We've got growth groups. He shows up in your growth groups. Why? Because you show up. They believe in eternal salvation and they believe in the finished work of Christ. That's one of the things that mark the ecclesia. We have our own religious rights. I hate to use the word religious, but it's just a good way to define it in terms of words. We have our own religious rights. We hold our own religious meetings and we manage our own affairs according to biblical principles. I mean, I don't want to rock your boat today, but Christians should not be suing Christians. 
you say, well, where do you get that? It's in the Bible. Christians ought to have the courage to sit down eye to eye and work this out. That's what it means when we're ecclesia. We manage our own affairs. And yeah, we, I, I remember uh, I'm making all these references of Watermark. I wasn't planning on it. I wasn't, they're not in my notes. But we had a, a, a brother come that was a guest. And his big question that day was, why are there all these denominations? Why are we so divided? Well, I didn't have a great answer for him. Except that we just get, you know, we just get hung up on minor details. Here's what I told him. I don't think it's made him happy. But here's what we told him, if I remember correctly. Unity on the essentials, love on all the non-essentials. Well, guys, there's only one thing that's essential. And his name is Jesus. And we're in unity. I'm in u- unity with my Baptist brothers, my Catholic brothers. I'm in unity with uh, brothers and sisters. I'm in unity with Church of Christ, with Methodists, with Episcopals, with Lutherans. If they believe that Jesus died on the cross, was buried uh, and resurrected on the third day and sitting at the right hand of the Father, I'm in unity with them. Amen. I might not have all the, the pet doctrines and all the different things that, that people think. We may, not be, we may not be in agreement on everything because, but they're non-essential. It's only one thing that's going to get us to heaven. And his name is Jesus. I'm kind of like Paul. I speak in tongues more than you all. But it's better to speak 10,000 words in English than five words in tongues that nobody understands. When you're, my, my prayer my prayer language is between me and God. It's not for me to stand up here and pray in tongues out loud in front of you because it won't help you. Amen. It only helps me. Now, you might not agree, and you might, not, you might say, well, Pastor, I don't do that. Well, that's okay because we're in unity on the essential, but on the non-essentials, we don't have to have unity. We've got a person in our church that used to go to a church uh, attend a group of churches that believed if you didn't speak in tongues and weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit, you weren't going to heaven. Well, that's not anywhere in the Bible. There's no place that you can find that in the Bible. There's no place you can even remotely justify that kind of theology. Except they try. We're going to get unified during this fast. We're all going to be fasting something. We're all going to be praying the same thing. And I'm telling you, God is going to be on the move because when God is first, things change. When the church, the ecclesia, when we're in harmony, (coughs) things happen. Oh, my goodness. See if I can wet my whistle here. So the church... Some of you will remember the series I did a few months ago, Five Ways to Surprise the World, and the key thing was to live a questionable life. Well, now, most of us, when we hear the phrase questionable, we think somebody walking down the street here, and we see the way they're walking, and they look a little questionable. We don't think about that in a positive light, but here's what I meant. If you live in such a way that you're different than the world, you think different, you talk different, you act different, people at your job, people in your school, young people, people all around you look at you and they're like, they're a little off. Questionable. They have questions for you. Why do you do this? Why do you bring your Bible to school? Why do you read your Bible in the break room? Why do you pray before you eat? Why are you so nice? You used to be meaner than a junkyard dog. Now you're nice. What happened? Jesus is what happened. Living a questionable life. So that's what, church is not a building. It's a group of people that are outside this building living for God. And I've got a really short list, and I I would love to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm going to give you the references 
for the church in one book of the Bible, Ephesians. Except there's, I've got seven pictures of the church. One of them is in Hebrews, and it's number one. There are seven pictures of the church in Hebrews chapter 1. I mean, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 24 and 25, the church is called an assembly. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, it's called a body. And you could side note that, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I would put that down there. As we, it's a workmanship. Paul describes it, the church, as his workmanship. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand. So the ecclesia, we're an assembly, we're a body, we're a piece of work. You can, you can look at your neighbor, look at your kids and say, you're a piece of work. Yeah, you are a piece of work. You're his workmanship. That word workmanship in the Greek means multifaceted. It's like when light hits a prism, if you've ever done that experiment. And a light hits a prism and it goes out in multiple colors. That's what that word workmanship means. Number four, in Ephesians 2.19, the church is described as a family. In um, number five, in Ephesians 2, 20 and 22, is described as a temple, hence the building. But really what makes the church is the people in the building. Amen? And it's in the sense that the church is a living organism, not an organization. Number six, the sixth picture of the church is found in Ephesians 3, 1 through 10. It's a mystery. And people outside these four walls don't understand us. You know what? I've said this so many times and I just feel inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is going to help somebody this morning. It's going to help you communicate what the church is. Most of the people driving by this church today and driving by other churches, they know what we're against. They don't know what we're for. It's time you and I rise up as the real church and we let people know what we're for, not what we're against. I'm for every homosexual in this city. I want them to get saved. I want them to come to know Jesus. I want every person struggling with a transgender identity. I want them to come to Generations Church and find out the God who sent his son to die for them on the cross. I am for them. Are you? Every prostitute, every drug dealer, every alcoholic. I'm for them. Are you? I'm not against them. And the people that don't, we're a mystery. We're, it is a mystery. How can, you, how can you be for those people? Because Jesus died for them. Amen. They're worthy of it. Let me tell you what, before you became a Christian, except for the grace of God, there you go. You, some of you were addicted. Some of you were full of lust. Some of you were full of anger. Some of you were full of pride. But you met Jesus and he changed your life. Some of you were headed for prison. Some of you have been in prison. Jesus changed your life. You met someone that could change you from the inside out. The church is a mystery. You say, there's a church in prison? I don't know. Go back there and ask Danny. He met Jesus in prison and found a church in prison. Mm. The seventh picture of a church is marriage. Found in Ephesians chapter 5. It's not the graduation supper of the Lamb. It's not the coronation of the Lamb. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's going to, when that happens, the next thing that happens, are you ready for this? There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Because the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's the picture of when the husband meets the bride at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Somebody ought to get excited about that. We're closer to that happening than we've ever been in the world. So these pictures of the church of the ecclesia. And guys, 
Ladies and gentlemen, that's just one book of the Bible. That's just out of the book of Ephesians. God's got a plan for the ecclesia. Get plugged into the house. God, those seven things, God is doing something through the church. And let me tell you another little nugget of truth that's not in my notes. And I can't believe I missed this in my notes. But the Holy Spirit is so faithful. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, I will build my church. It's the only place that Jesus ever said he was going to build anything. Now, I get it. People have TV ministries, radio ministry right here, right there. But he never said he was going to build that stuff unless it's connected to the local church. And that's what I love. We've been working on a branded logo for committed couples. And, and Jeannie and her gifted talents and skills has come up with all these options for us. But we're branding committed couples. And it says in the branding It says a ministry of Generations Church. And it has our logo. I love that. Because that's, Jesus wants to build things that are connected to the local church. It's the only thing he said he would build. We start trying to do things that are disconnected from the local church. And it's not going to work well. It's not going to flow. So how do you get plugged in? What do you do to get plugged into a local church? I've got three things I'm going to share with you. And I forgot to tell you on the back of your bulletin, you could have been taking notes on all this, but most of you know that. There's fill in the blanks back there. How do you plug into a local church? Number one, don't be a consumer. This is not a country club. Hello. You might get mad at me for saying that. But you don't pay dues. Your tithe is not dues for everybody to walk around and serve you. I'll say it again. I'll say it with a smile this time. You don't pay your tithes so that everybody can, so the pastor and the staff can serve you. It's not a country club. This is a living organism that was birthed and born in the heart of a loving God to reach a dying world. And it takes every one of us. Yes, come to church on Sunday and hear the word of God. Take good notes. There's going to be a talk sheet when you go to your growth group. And you're going to, you're going to there, with scriptures that weren't in the message, there's going to be ideas and thoughts and experiences and prayers that are prayed in a growth group. But you're going to go out from there and touch a hurting world. Don't be a consumer. Number two, here's how you plug into a local church. Be a contributor. Well, if I'm not going to be a consumer, what am I going to be? I'm going to be a contributor. What am I going to contribute? Time, talent, and treasure. Give your time. Plug in. In 2023, we had more men get involved in our children's ministry than at any time in the history of our church. Hallelujah! Women do, you know, well, working with kids, that's women's work. Shut up. Our children need the influence of men. Men, 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 men. David Blankenhorn in 1994, wrote a book called Fatherless in America. And he said in that book that 40% of all American teenagers go to sleep at night without an, Amer- without an influence of a loving father. That statistic is old, folks. I guarantee you it's more than that. I haven't done the research on it again, but that was a secular book. It wasn't even a Christian book. When I was a youth pastor, I was reading stuff like that to connect with young people. But be a contributor of your time, your talent, and your treasure. You say, yeah, you're just a typical preacher. All you want is my money. (laughs) Well, whoever told you that lied might have been the devil. Because here's what I know. Here's what the Bible says. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's at. So if you want me to look at your checkbook and check out your heart, I'll be glad to. 
but I don't need your money. God doesn't need your money. God wants your heart because when he gets your heart, he knows he'll have your money. If I teach on giving, if I teach on stewardship, it's just to help you because if I don't teach on that stuff, I'm robbing you of biblical truth that will change your life. Amen or oh me? I don't care what you say. I'm still going to preach it. It's the truth. Here's the third thing you do to get plugged into a local church. Attend. Show up. Butts and seats. Sunday, growth group, Awanas, youth group. Man, there's no substitute for showing up. Had a professor in Bible school, and he taught me this principle about showing up, or he taught, tried to teach everybody this. I, I learned it. He said, you need to show up with a notebook in hand to every class, and you take notes on every class. And somebody said, well, some of these guys that teach our classes, they're dull as dirt. <laughs> I don't think anybody's ever said that about me. I hope not. I try not to be dull. But he said, take notes on everybody. There's a nugget, there's a truth, there's a concept, there's a principle, and you're gonna, the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you every time. And you know what? For 45 years, well, 40 plus years of being a Christian, if I'm not preaching, I'm sitting there taking notes. Because... God's got something for me in that service. He's got something for you at church. He's got something for you. You say, well, Pastor, every sermon you preach doesn't hit me like, like last week's. I, don't, I understand. That's why I pray at the end of every service. If you've got a nugget, a truth, a concept, a principle, raise your hand. I want to pray for you. And you know what? Some of you get principles and concepts, and you get nuggets of truth, and it wasn't even in my sermon. The Holy Spirit used what I said to take you off on a rabbit trail and speak to you. And you're sitting there, you're sitting there writing, writing down, taking notes. And I'm going, oh, man. Man, that Dina, she's taking notes, man. Look at her. She's probably not even listening to me. <laughs> she's probably writing something down that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to her about her life. And it took a scripture. And, and the Holy Spirit is talking to her, not me. Yeah. Amen. Let, see, right there. And you know what? I am... I am not offended by that. that. There's nothing about that, that that upsets me. But what is so cool, because we're in church, we're a body, we're a family, and God's here, and he's speaking to people. Amen. So, about as practical as you can get. And I read to you one more time, let me just read to you Psalm 92, 13, because this is God's will for your life and my life, and that is that we get plugged in, stay plugged in, find the connection of family, marriage. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish, flourish, prosper, grow, increase. There's so many things that that word flourish means. You will flourish in the courts. Of our God. Some of you didn't even know that verse was in the Bible. I want to read a portion of scripture. Close your Bibles. Put your pens away, please. It'll be on the screen. And I'm just, this is an act of obedience from this morning over in my office praying before I came to church. I hope you receive something from that being plugged into the house. I hope you hear the Holy Spirit. And I understand you're here at church. You say, well, why did you preach that to us? We're here. I understand that. There's people online that need to be in the house. 
You have friends that need to be in the house. You can now tell them the benefits of coming to church. You can now communicate some of those thoughts and truths. You've got notes in your hands. But somebody needs to hear what I'm about to say. I know I needed it. Numbers chapter 9. It's quite a bit of scripture. Somebody say amen. Amen. Numbers 9. On the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered it. But from evening till morning, the cloud over the tabernacle looked like a pillar of fire. This was the regular pattern. At night, the cloud that covered the tabernacle had the appearance of fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from over the sacred tent, the people of Israel would break camp and follow it. And wherever the cloud settled, the people of Israel would set up camp. In this way, they traveled and camped at the Lord's command whenever he told them to go. Then they remained in their camp, and as long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle. If the cloud remained over the tabernacle for a long time, the Israelites stayed and performed their duty to the Lord. Sometimes the cloud would stay over the tabernacle for only a few days. So the people would stay for only a few days, as the Lord commanded. Then the Lord's command, they would break camp and move on. Sometimes the cloud stayed only overnight and lifted the next morning. But day or night, when the cloud lifted, the people broke camp and moved on. Whether the cloud stayed above the tabernacle for two days, a month, or a year, the people of Israel stayed in camp and did not move on. But as soon as it lifted, they broke camp and moved on. So they camped or traveled at the Lord's command, and they did whatever the Lord told them through Moses. The tabernacle is a picture of the church. Wave at me if you can agree to that with me. It's an Old Testament picture of the church. The tabernacle was a tent, not a building. It was something that could be broken down and moved. The 10 plus times that I've been to Mongolia, the majority of people live in what they call gares. It's a tent. It's a round, circular tent. It can be broken down in 30 minutes, but it takes two hours to set it up. But they're nomadic people. Only a million people, million, 1.5, live in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. The nation has 5 million people in it. So... Four plus million people live in gares out in nomadic culture, breaking down a tent like we're talking about. I just share that with you as a way of a point of reference of them breaking down the tabernacle and moving. The cloud, the fire symbolize the presence of God. Raise your hand if you can agree with that symbolism. Verse 16 says, This was a regular pattern. At night, the cloud that covered the tabernacle appeared like fire. In other words, there were patterns. Even the church back then, just like today, the the church had customs. The church had, as I read earlier about the church rites. It had meetings. It had a certain way that they did things. And the cloud and the pillar were normal. Whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, the people of Israel would break camp and follow it. That phrase is in there over and over and over. In other words, what that phrase means, when the presence of God moved, the people moved. They were not stuck in a rut. They were not stuck in a a formal set of religious ideas. They followed the cloud. They followed the fire. And when the camp, when the cloud stayed, they stayed. When the fire stayed. Notice it says in one place whether the cloud moved at night or the fire moved at night. Can you imagine the presence of God moving at midnight? And them packing up their tents? That's what it hints at in this text. Verse 20, 21 and 22, listen to this. I'm going to reread them. Sometimes the cloud would stay over the tabernacle for only a few days, so the people would stay for only a few days, as the Lord commanded. And the Lord's command, they would break camp and move on. Sometimes the cloud stayed only overnight and lifted the next morning. 
But day or night, when the cloud lifted, the people broke camp and moved. Whenever the cloud stayed above the the church, the tabernacle, for two days, a month or a year, the people stayed. And in the camp, they did not move. Are you in this thing for the long haul? Or are you just in it for the feel good? Are you going to serve God no matter what time of day, no matter what time of night, no matter when the cloud moves, when the fire moves, are you in this thing for the long haul? Or are you just in it when, when you got the spiritual buzz and you made the decision and it felt good? Ooh, well, all of a sudden life got hard again and that you had to face some difficult circumstances. Because listen, you, you sowed some seeds before you were a believer. And all, those seeds may come to roost. We've got a guy that helped paint this church that he told me a year ago he was ready to help paint this church and he had a, some criminal charges against him. His story to tell, not my story to tell, but he decided on his own, I'm going to go turn myself in. He got saved right here. He crossed the line, stepped over the line, said, I'm going to follow Jesus. Came to church, came to church, came to church, made a decision to help us paint. And then all of a sudden he called me up and said, I'm going I'm going to go turn myself in. I'll be away for a while. You know why that is? You can get saved and some of the seeds you sowed in your past are seeds you're going to reap. Christy, becoming a Christian is easy. Living for God isn't always so simple. You say, come on, Pastor Ed, why don't you preach something that's going to Make me want to say amen. <laughs> I want to preach the truth to you. Because the truth is what's going to help you live. You can ask God for grace and mercy. And we live in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. God can give you grace. I thank God. <laughs> I thank God every day I look at my kids and my grandkids Hallelujah, they did not reap all the seeds I sowed before I became a Christian. <laughs> so grateful that I got that they got mercy and grace. But here's the question in this text. And I'm going to put it in a form that's not in the text, but you'll understand it when I say it. What is God? breathing on in your life where's the cloud where's the fire where's the <sighs> what is God breathing on that you're doing and what he's not breathing on stop it follow the cloud follow the fire but what the when the cloud's not there when the fire's not there, when he's not breathing on it, stop it. And as long as the presence and as long as he's breathing on it, keep doing it. For 26 years, God flung a door wide open for me to speak in public schools and colleges and universities and churches and camps about teenagers living a sexually pure life. God opened doors on national television. God opened doors to do four documentaries about teenagers and sexual purity. One in France, one in uh, London, one, two here in America. God opened up some amazing doors. But here's what happened. In 2008, President Obama got elected into office. And on January the 1st of 2009, every single penny of federal funding that schools were paying me with. Safe and drug-free schools, the abstinence grants that President Bush made available, and character counts. They were paying me from all of those different funds. President Obama signed executive orders stopping every one of those programs. Wow. Overnight, all the funding went poof. Wow. Gone. I had schools, Are you, listen to me, this is what I'm trying to, trying to help you. I had schools calling me, 
Well, we don't have the money to pay you to be sex ed anymore. But listen, here's what we need. We love the way you speak. We love the way you handle teenagers. We love the way you work with our staff. We love what you do. Why don't you change your talk and come talk about tolerance and come talk about bullying? We want you to come back, and we'll use the federal grant money for those programs to pay you. I said, God's not breathing on that. God's not, that's not where the cloud is. And I didn't say that to them. They wouldn't get it. But I knew in my heart, after reaching six million kids in public school, that didn't count all the churches and the camps and conferences that I talked to. After reaching all those kids, all of a sudden, it's over. I didn't open that door. God did. And so when the cloud moved, I moved. And the cloud moved off. You say, well, that was circumstantial. Sometimes God, God's wisdom and God's will, he operates. You look at the circumstances and he's moved on. I'm telling you right now, this is the word of the Lord for you. It's the word of the Lord for me. It's the word of the Lord for this church. Stay under the cloud. Stay under the fire. And everything else, stop it. And I'm going to tell you what I, if I know anything as the pastor of Generations Church, the one thing that God is breathing on more than anything else that we're doing as a church is our growth groups. God is breathing. There are people in this room that didn't used to be coming. To, they weren't planted in the house. They got planted in the house because of growth groups. Get connected. Get connected to the body of Christ. Even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. Yeah. The first thing God said was not good in all his creation in Genesis 2.18. He said, it is not good for man to be alone. Isolation, if anything we learned out of COVID, isolation will kill you. Get connected to the church. Stand together with me this morning. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you've spoken to our hearts today. Lord, I thank you that there's truths, nuggets. There's things that you've spoken to, uh, to individuals today. There's concepts, there's principles there's things that you've spoken to people that they need to stop. You're not breathing on that. And Lord, there are other things that you're pointing out that you are breathing on that. There's things you're doing in marriages and children and in the relationship of parents and children. And I'm just praying, Lord, that everybody that heard your voice today, that Lord, that point of obedience in their life, they'll say yes. If you heard the Lord today, I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to ask you to move or put a mic in your face. But you know that you know you heard a truth, a nugget, a concept, a principle that is going to require your obedience. I'm going to count to three, and I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Put your hand up. Hands all over this room. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm thanking you that people heard your voice and not mine. Lord, I was just a willing vessel. But Lord, they heard your voice. Speak to them. Lord, strengthen them. Encourage them. Lord, seal the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. And Lord, this coming week, remind them of the steps of obedience that they need to take. In the name of Jesus. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And I don't know everybody that's online. And I certainly don't know everybody that's in the room today. 
But I want to ask you the most important question of your life. It's more important than who you'll marry, where you'll go to college, the next job you'll have, the next car you'll have. It's the most important question of your life. If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? And if you, don't, if you can't say yes to that, we can change that right here, right now. It's really simple. It's up on the screen. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this. If you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, you'll be saved. You say, preacher, what do I confess? You confess you're a sinner and you need a Savior. What do I believe? I believe that Jesus Christ came and lived a sinless, perfect life and died on a cross for my sins. He was buried and he was resurrected on the third day. And now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for you to make the best decision of your life. Maybe you made that decision 10 years ago, but for whatever reason, you walked away. And you know that today's the day you're supposed to come back and say, I got to get back where the cloud is. I got to get back where the fire is. I got to get my life right with the Lord. Well, that's easy too. You just start over. You just pray the same prayer that we're going to lead everybody in. We're gonna lead, I'm going to lead everybody in the room, everybody online. I'm going to lead you in this prayer. We're all going to pray it out loud. It's, it's going to make it easier for the person that needs Jesus. Are you ready? Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thanks for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for loving me that much. I am a sinner. And I need a Savior. Will you forgive me? I've sinned. And I need forgiveness. I invite you to come into my life. And be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're, in, if you're online and you prayed that prayer and you meant it, there's a link right there. You can click on that and say, Preacher, I prayed that prayer with you. And I'm serious. And we'll send you. We're going to send you this little book right here. We give it to everybody that makes a decision to follow Jesus. It says, Now what? If you're in the room and you're coming back to the Lord or you're in the room and you prayed that prayer for the first time, you say, Pastor, I'm serious. I meant it. Would you just raise your hand right now? Anybody in this room need to raise your hand and say, I prayed that prayer with you, Pastor, and I'm serious. Amen. It's great. Lord, send some people that need Jesus to Generations Church. Help us be the ones that will help us be bringers, inviters, Amen.